Hello and welcome to this latest Human Rights Podcast. With me to review the news and events of the past month is my co-host, the activist, the university lecturer and business consultant, Miro Griffiths, MBE. Miro, how are you doing today? I'm very well, thank you. Excellent. Last month, Miro, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe held a hearing to discuss the right to work of people with impairment. Here's a few extracts from the hearing. Yeah. If a big company in one country promotes including people with disability, uh, probably, and when they see that it works, they take it to do all the subsidiaries. So it's also important. We work with the Spanish multinationals and we work with multinationals that are from other countries. And when their parent com company is really responsible and mm, inclusive with disability, if you are in Spain, you want to be mo even more because you have to tell to your parent company that you are doing it well and you are fulfilling with their policies. To give you a bit of the main features of the French system, the integration of persons with disabilities on the labour market is not a new idea in France. Beginning in the 1920s, two acts uh, made it compulsory for employers to recruit the war disabled. After the Second World War, a new act for the first time um, created quota recruitments to recruit persons with disabilities for companies of over 10 employees, but there was no obligation to achieve any particular result. In 1975, a new act created a uh, guarantee of resources for persons with disabilities and reaffirmed the principle of mandatory employment. This act uh, lays down the importance of prevention and the detection of disabilities, mandatory education for young persons with disabilities, the accessibility of public institutions, and keeping persons with disabilities in an ordinary work framework. An additional law was then adopted in 1987, which creates an obligation of employment for persons with disabilities and the war disabled in companies of over 20 employees in the private sector and introduces this legal rate of 6%. And this law provides for the payment of a contribution um, for private companies which fail to meet this quota. And this law gave rise to the AGFIP body, which is the body in charge of managing this uh, development fund for the in professional and vocational integration of persons with disabilities. But I think it's, that's when I personally found it was the most difficult, is the first job. Why? Because people, the employers, don't know really what, what it's going to be like. Is, is David or is whoever going to be able to do the job? Is he going to be able to do it quick enough? Is it what's going to happen if he's going to go, uh, if we need to go to the other end to, uh, for a business trip somewhere? Is he going to be able to manage? Is he going to be able to take the plane, the train, the, etc.? He, he can't drive, so how's going to... So you need to be very uh, reassuring. So, Miro, what should be done to guarantee the right to work for people with impairments? So I think the, the first thing to do would be to utilize what is already available in terms of uh, recommendations and, and ideas. And I would immediately go to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And within that, of course, we have the articles around uh, access to, to work and, and access to employment. But there are a number of general comments within the um, documentation produced by, by the committee. And although none of the co general comments specifically talk about uh, access to, to employment, I think there are a number of areas of thought that can inspire um, ideas for states, for the private sector, for public services to explore in terms of trying to improve uh, the inclusion of sale people within, uh, within the employment sector. But there, there are also a number of other avenues. So whilst we have uh, advice at that level, I think we also need to think about how uh, emerging research highlights the, a number of barriers that salespeople uh, encounter when trying to access employment. Um, so I remember there was, there was a, uh, an interesting piece of research done by somebody called uh, Ir Irvine who talks about how there is a need to, uh, I suppose, review and evaluate 
the quality of employment support and within that how do we provide advice and support for people, disabled people during the process of, of, of job searching, of uh, how to um, uh, ex uh, you know, understand your ba the barriers within, within employment as well as what the solutions may be to ensure that person feels valued and respected within the process. And of course, there are, when we think about uh, access to employment for disabled people, whilst we may automatically think about people with physical impairments, and of course those barriers will be uh, environmental and perhaps attitudinal or uh, uh, the significance of personal assistance. What's very, what's very key to this is that we don't lose sight of the issues which are further marginalizing people with mental health conditions, people with learning disabilities from accessing and gaining access to uh, meaningful employment. The Parliamentary Assembly hearing, uh, Miro, revealed once again that private employers would rather pay fines than meet their social obligations. What do you make of the view that this idea of a social responsibility is outmoded now that the private sector dominates the economy and that in the new liberal market economy, profit is everything? Well, there is some truth in that. And when you look at the work of, for example, um, uh, Martinez and, and Garcia in their in their critique of neoliberalism, we've we've got this the the this fundamental basis of the rule of the market, which is now is existing at the global level. We've got uh, cuts in in public expenditure. We've got uh, the implementation of austerity measures, taking back which which rolls back the access to support systems for disabled people, and this extensive privatization and deregulation has. Uh, contributed towards disabled people's marginalization in terms of accessing employment. That's not to say that capitalism and neoliberalism has, has caused or created disability, but of course disability has manifested and has taken a, 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 a new form within this economic and political structure. And many of the, the materialist thinkers um, involved in disability studies would argue that you know, capitalism is, is inherently unequal. And it will never be able to produce fair social policies. So the idea of trying to create a, um, a system where disabled people will be able to access meaningful employment, be valued, have the right level of support in order to be on a, on a level playing field with non-sale people uh, in, in the work sector is, is, is quite naive. Because, and I, think there, there, and I think there is some truth to this, which is under, under the current economic system, the... The, the, the system is, is acting in the interests of a certain group of people. And those, that certain group of people is not sale people. So how do you ensure that we that sale people are able to access uh, the right level of support to be in employment? And I think the focus, on one hand, people will say, uh, revolutionize the system, move away from capitalist and neoliberal ideas of, of employment. On the other hand, people talk about these kind of tweaks that we make in order to ensure that people can access um, the job market and have the right level of support. And I think we need to have the space to discuss the implications of both sides within that. But we shouldn't lose sight of the, of the fact that there are people who want to, disabled people who want to work um, and will need a right level of support to do that. And at the moment, the policies that are being implemented by the state and the reactions of the, of the private sector um, to, to ensure that they are being proactive in employing disabled people is failing um, quite extensively and different action needs to be taken in order to address the situation. But I still think there needs to be space for us to, be to debate what um, are the severe implications of trying to uh, fit uh, people who are marginalized within a system which is built on the idea that there will never be equality. Uh, between between different groups within society. Miro, how do you overcome the idea that hiring disabled people is a costly practice for business? How do you make those costs economically, morally, socially worthwhile to private companies who whose management is always going to be as assessed by this profit motive? Well, I think that that's, that's key to isn't it? The idea of trying to aspire to create concentrated wealth to create profits to have that being the driving force for making decisions as to 
who you employ, what support you give them, the benefits that people get to gain employment. There needs to be some movement on that and to assess what it means to be um, a productive member of society because we disabled people will never fit into the neoliberal idea of, of what it means to be a productive member of society because disabled people are disruptive to that idea and therefore this is why we have uh, extensive uh, uh, experiences of ableism within within society which tries to push disabled people aside and, and segregate them or indeed uh, isolate them. So what you have is, have is, we need to be in a position to uh, assess what it means to be productive in society. That doesn't mean to denying sale people the opportunities to work if they want to work, and they can work, but the, the, that's, that would be my first point, is, is to try to, to, to have that space to debate the, the, uh, the, pro the productivity of, of being a productive member of society. The next point I would think about is this, this idea of responsibility. Now, what we currently have is employers who are undemocratic, who probably have an unclear purpose as to how they fit into the social functioning of society, and of course operate from a very elitist behaviour. You then have the next level, which is the, uh, the, the majority of workers, disabled and non-disabled, are in insecure positions, and therefore that leads to a reluctance in trying to demand change and trying to uh, create a better working and living conditions for people who, who, who are able to and want to work. And this is what's led to the, to, to the uh, to, for some sociologists to call it you know, the precarious class, the people who are in such precarious situations. They won't challenge because they know that ultimately the system will just move them aside and go, to, go for somebody else. So then when you include the issue of disability, you've then got um, sale people who have expectations placed upon them uh, in order to address the situation that, that they find themselves in, and that the responsibility to include sale people shifts to the individual usually in order to suit the, 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 the employer. So you have this problem of having inadequate assessment procedures which don't actually tackle the issue at, at the root of its, of its nature. You don't have the right level of support being provided. You have employers being reluctant to do something about it because of that desire, that's, uh, that, that uh, fixation on trying to create profit and wealth. And then you have um, you know, the, the, the accountability not there because employers feel like they don't need to do anything about it because, as you said, they would rather pay a fine or they rather uh, just, just ignore the issue. Or even worse, and I think this is where you get this kind of emergence of uh, socially conscious uh, capitalists who try to argue that what they're doing is is uh, is helping the society in terms of its nature, nurturing, in terms of its cohesion. But actually, what is fundamentally wrong with the system is that desire to create wealth, which goes well beyond um, the, the 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 basic needs that need to be met of people in society. So there are a number of levels there that need to try and, that need to be addressed. But I think if we, if we kind of separate it into the responsibility of the worker, responsibility of the employer, and the responsibility of the individual, we see how messy the situation is and that our current approaches to support and sale people don't work. And then at the same time of that, if you think about um, the, the need to uh, continuously highlight the problems surrounding sale people uh, in, in employment in terms of the barriers that they face, well, then you have the issue of how do you have, uh, you know, equality and human rights commissions in member states that will be able to action this and be able to come up with the solutions and come up with raising awareness of the of the of the problems at stake? But across Europe and indeed across the globe, we have seen a, um, a, the decimation of funding to equality and human rights commissions, which means that they are then not able to safeguard and protect the people in society nor are they able to actually produce um, coherent data which will then lead to the solutions, uh, you know, which will lead to the solutions in order to try to address the problem. So there are a number of different issues that, uh, within play, and that's before we even start to think about how, on the one hand, we have this narrative of, oh, disabled people should be valued and be in work and they should be supported, but then at the same time we have member states running institutionalization agendas where disabled people will be housed and warehoused 
in, envir- in, in, in areas where there is extreme violence, extreme marginalization, no opportunity to be part of the community, no opportunity to be uh, perceived or embrace the idea of being an active citizen. So how do we try and challenge this when you've got so many different um, complex issues which all feed into this into this particular focus that we have today, which is on dis- the disability pay gap? Because the answer is not just have a more socially conscious employer or have an assessment procedure that works um, that, that, is, that works in terms of understanding the needs of the individual and also places responsibility on society to address the problems because the problems go much deeper than that and it goes back down to that, that lens of ableism, it goes back down to the existence of the institutionalization agenda. I also think there's a problem with um, our current education system because as uh, many of the inclusive educationalist uh, activists will talk about is that how can we be pressuring and placing emphasis on ensuring disabled t- people are able to access employment when there is always a question mark hanging over every disabled person's life when it comes to the prospect of, of accessing education system or indeed allowing uh, member states to have systems where we say for every disabled child we, or every disabled learner, we will scrutinize and, and decide whether you should go to a, uh, to a to an, to the mainstream education system, i.e., the normal system, or one which is built on the ideas of segregation because they want to get you out of the way of the productivity of society. So when, once we start to unpick it, we see how it's not just about the employer, or it's not just about the state's response. There's a multitude of different issues that need to be addressed. Well, on that point of education, Miro, what do you make of the view then that the lack of access of many people with impairment to non-segregated education and vocational skills training is the real reason why so many people, so many disabled people, uh, struggle to find jobs? To an extent, I, I would agree with that. I think uh, I think there is, there is a real need, uh, an essential need, to consider how the education system that we have currently is not fit for purpose and has um, got away with for so many years are riding this line of exclusion. And of course, if we look at our education system from uh, from school upwards, it is, be- it is built on elitist behavior. You must strive to be the best in your class so then you get better rewards and better access in, the, uh, in, in your community. And we should praise the people who excel in these, in these subjects. And what's happened is our education system has reflected the individual competitiveness that has plagued our society for so long because it's always about competition. But education shouldn't be about competition. Education is actually about being having the skills and opportunities to challenge, to critique, to challenge the status quo, to break down the information you've had previously and build it up with new ideas and new ways of thinking and to explore and be creative. But, that's what, but, not what, but what we have now is process after process, which is designed to say you uh, must I- absorb this information, uh, which is objective, of course, because there is no, until you get to university, there's no idea of, 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 of challenging uh, the information that you're being given to you. And then it's to say you have to regurgitate it in order, to, in order for the door to be opened to the next level. So there's a real problem of, of the competition within society, uh, within, within the education system. And that's before we even think about how historically the education system has been designed. Because, and this is where it's fascinating when we, when we, when we, when we contextualize it within disability, because we have an education system which is built on the Industrial Revolution. The idea that you must go to here so you gain the skills and, and, and the learning and the obedience to then go and become a happy em- a worker for the, st- for the systems uh, that already exist. And you will abide and you will conform to the expectations of the employer, of the ruling class. But actually, what happened was, when, when you saw the Industrial Revolution emerge, this is when you also saw the uh, explosion of segregated schooling and institutionalization. Because there was a question mark over sale people. Why should we include sale people when they're not going to be productive to the, to the workforce? There's no point educating them, so move them aside, place them somewhere else so they don't become a disruption. So questioning the, ba- the basis of education is, is important. Access to education for sale people is key as well. 
But what I don't want to see, and this is where uh, I hope many inclusive educationalists will agree with me, is that we don't want to see the, the, the driving force for ensuring disabled people uh, are included within the education system is not to say the, the individual must fit the current system. It's to say there needs to be a radical overhaul of our education system. And we need to reflect on, the, on, the, on our history of how education has evolved. We need to think about the, the, the significance of the Enlightenment period and the different models of education that were proposed during this. But we also need to think about the infiltration of neoliberal, uh, neoliberalist economics within the universities, within, within our education system, which has prevented not just disabled people, but many communities from accessing education or seeing the purpose of education. Because if we have people who are um, disgruntled with the education system at present, when we have people who don't, don't um, see the, the significance of education, that's not the fault of the individual. That's the fault of society to say we haven't um, mapped and implemented an education system that reflects the significance of what people want in their lives. And we shouldn't just continue along this role of, or, or this, this, this process of having an education system that just meets the ideals of the private sector and the, and the, and the current economic system. And that's before you even bring into the fact of how disabled people are um, not even represented within the positions of power and authority within the education system or within the university. I think in the UK, less than 5% of academics are, uh, would consider themselves disabled. So there is a major issue as well of, of having people in the system who actually are reflecting the purpose of the system, who are facilitating that knowledge transition, who are trying to support the learning of, it, of, of, of others, who don't actually represent the people who are being marginalised in our society. So change education system is one, but you can you can flush as many sale people as you want through a, through, through an, uh, a, a, an accessible education system. It doesn't mean that they're going to get jobs at the end of it, because as we've seen, the majority of people going through education system don't get jobs. We have you know issues with uh, unemployment, issues of in work poverty. So if we do, if we take the topic of disability, we can then see how by unpicking it and unpacking it to see the complexity of the problem, we also realize that actually employment, um, support to gain employment, the education system is not working for vast swathes of our society. You've been in government, Miro. Did you take part in discussions on how to get more dis disabled people into work? Yeah, I, and I did. And, and of course, we, we had uh, many conversations about how to, uh, you know, different ways in order to to address the situation, whether that be uh, providing special support, whether it was about um, doing not. I mean, I, I you know, I, I was against the ideas when I've worked with, when I've worked in member states that that go along the line of trying to create campaigns to raise awareness of the importance of disabled workers or the skills disabled people have, because the approaches that are taken are just small tweaks to the issue. They're not necessarily addressing the core problem of it. And I think what's quite key is that you've got uh, many, many governments across Europe will try to um, demonstrate this, this consciousness towards um, the, you know, this conscientious approach to wanting to support to people to work, whilst also running a, a, running a, a, a line of sale people are worklessness, uh, or they don't work, or you know, that sale people uh, and, and other people as well who, who are marginalised, it's their individual responsibility to get out of that. Um, you know, we need to be tougher on, on uh, social security, on the idea of sanctions. So when you're running both lines at the same time, you're never going to get actually to the end goal of trying to include sale people because you can't try to appease the, the electorate by saying we will be tough on social security and we will scrutinize everybody's uh, activities and everyone's behaviors and we should all take responsibility to call out uh, those who are deemed to be uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, exploiting the system, but at the same time then trying to make messages of, of trying to support people. It just doesn't work. And I think you know, the, the actions that have been taken so far has, uh, has relied too heavily on this romantic notion that uh, you know, we have, if we have good legislation, we'll, we'll tackle the issue. If we have uh, better professionals to support people, we'll tackle the issue. None of this has worked. 
I think we th there's a real need to listen to the voices of activists, nationally and internationally, who have been trying to demonstrate that so far there has been inadequate responses to to improving the situation with sale people in workplace situations. I hear what you say, Miro, but whilst you're waiting for Root and Branch reform, surely there's place to do something. For example, in the Parliamentary Assembly hearing, there were some voices who said, what we need to do is, it goes back to an earlier question to which you answered, we need to allay the fears of, of uh, employers, which is to say, we need to, or disabled rights activists need to show employers that there is a high cadre of uh, successful, competent, able people with disability, with impairment, who can be important additions to the workforce. And one of the speakers at the Parliamentary Assembly hearing was exactly that. He, I think he'd worked in sales, he was a commercial manager, and he showed that uh, being visually impaired was no barrier to him being successful in his work. So the idea that we should, that we should wait for perfection, it seems to be uh, a little hard. No, 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 that's a fair point. But what I would say is, I'm not saying that the system needs to be perfected. Oh, we need to wait for it to be perfected before um, we, 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 we push forward. What I'm saying is the, the focus of attention at the moment by some activists, uh, but the majority of this would be directed towards uh, the state and, and employers, is that they are looking at the wrong issues in order to address the situation. Or if I was going to be a bit uh, pessimistic and suspicious, I would say they're looking at the issues which are more convenient because you can go on as long as you want about the importance of role models or the importance of trying to get people to be a bit more confident about employing salespeople. That's really convenient when you're trying to also run this, an assessment procedure which is it's heavily medicalized, which is built on the idea of social security uh, is a gift to you and that you should be uh, sanctioned if you don't uh, meet the expectations of the state. So all these issues um, are going to be sidelined if we go down this route of, of role models. And the problem I've had, and I, again, when I was an advisor uh, in government and we had these, these, these uh, projects around trying to, uh, you know, the, the significance of, of uh, bringing out the disabled person who's going to talk about their experiences in a proactive way. What it does is, I think I've said it before on other podcasts, is it, 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 it's a one step forward, two steps back approach. You know, one person steps forward and says, this is great. You know, look at me. I've excelled in, in this in this current economic and political system that we have. So then everyone else says, well, why has everyone else done that? So it pushes everybody else back because those who can't reach that level for whatever reason, based on socioeconomic backgrounds, based on issues of, of, of class or, or, or gender or in terms of knowledge and or in terms of uh, uh, the impairment effects. Uh, so what happens is, Again, people then start to focus on the individual. You should be striving better because somebody like you, because, of course, every disabled person looks the same from it to everybody else when you're non-disabled. The idea that actually we don't look at the intrinsic issues which are creating the problems. Because I would say, look at the assessment procedures as a starting point. You've got uh, very um, very unhelpful, to some, to some point distressing, to some point... Uh, extremely, extremely destabilizing assessment procedures which perpetuate the issue of isolation, of marginalization. You know, there, is, there, is, there, is, there is startling research showing the correlation between people who are, who are told you must get a job and the reason why you haven't got a job is your fault and therefore to punish you for that, uh, for that kind of attitude, we're going to take your, take your social security away from you. And there's been startling evidence showing the, the rise of suicides in relation to the to, in relation to people having their social security cut. Now, what I would say is how a starting point for me would be how do we assess how uh, the right level of support for people? Because at the moment we have disabled people being assessed by medical professionals who, incidentally, are being uh, paid ex extreme well. Uh, their organisations are paying extreme well to to run this assessment procedures. So you have medical professionals running assessment procedures to identify the barriers that you have to employment. But they're not focusing on, on the society. They're not focusing on the employer's barriers. What they're focusing on is the individual's medical condition in order to understand what support is available. Well, if you've got activists 
talking about disability from a human rights point of view. If you've got activists taking a social model of disability approach, i.e. it is society's collective actions which cause sale people to be marginalised, not their impairments or their health conditions, then why would you run assessment procedures which continuously focus on the individual's medical label in order to understand what support should be provided? It doesn't make any sense. And a great example of that is, you know, uh, I've seen some assessment procedures where they'll say, you will be deemed capable uh, to work and therefore you will have social security taken off you if you can walk 20 meters. Well, that's fine if you can walk 20 meters. But actually, if your environment in terms of your tr public transport system does not is, is further than 20 meters, or indeed it takes you three hours to get to work, or indeed you can't actually uh, gain access to your to your workstation to do your work because of the way that your 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 uh, your boss is towards you, or in terms of uh, the lack of of of, uh, of personal assistance uh, to to provide you with assistance, then what was the point of those questions? All these questions are individualized because they don't take into account the problems being created by the state and by the private sectors. And then, of course, and this is why it makes me angry. Then you have the audacity of the state and the private private uh, sector to say, well, what's really going to help the situation is if we bring out the role model or we bring out you know, the idea of having better representation at board level, uh, sale people at board level positions. It doesn't do anything because the only people who are going to get those positions are the people who are able to transcend the current level of barriers within society. It does nothing to address those barriers in the first place. So this is why we've got a major problem with the disability pay gap, because we're not getting to the crux of the problem. We've got medicalized assessment procedures. We've got the state not taking responsibility for addressing disabled people's uh, access to support and access to work. And we've got a, a situation of an education system that doesn't uh, fit the purpose of what it's designed to do and by extension it then marginalizes people um, who it deems to be unproductive to the, to the functioning of society. We're going to come back to the disability pay gap later in our conversation Miro. So far we've been discussing the right to work. What do you make then of those activists, disability rights activists who argue for the right of disabled people not to work? Uh, I don't have a problem with it whatsoever and I think it raises a really important question which is this fixation on why people are deemed to be productive or non-productive. And it goes back to that question of how do, we, how do we judge what it means to be productive in society? Does being productive in society mean you get a job and then you abide by the rules being given to you, that you don't question that, that you're told when to work and when not to work, and that actually when other people don't work, you should be scrutinized in their behavior? The, you know, I go back to that narrative of uh, somebody's on social security so you should always question what they're doing because they possibly could be uh, fraudulently gaining access to the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the system. And this helps the narrative then because then you have people who will remove uh, social security or will go on a campaign of saying we will cut social security because X amount of people are fraudulently using it when actually the real data shows it to be much less than that. So the idea of the right not to work, I think, it is, is quite an important issue to debate because there are, there are people... Uh, disabled and non-disabled, who will not be able to work for a variety of different reasons. That's not an excuse. What it's a reflection of is this overwhelming pressure to say that our whole life existence is to is to drive towards this contribution to work. When actually, the the whole purpose of, of, of being of existing surely is 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 more than just being able to work and and and, and be productive in the eyes of the state or the eyes of the current economic and political system. So I think that, so I think when we have activists who say uh, we should be demanding the right not to work, I think what they're trying to do is, is trying to reshape the debate about what it means to be a, a contributor to society, what it means to be a citizen within our communities. Because at the moment, there's a very ableist narrative that is being employed in order to deem people who are worthy and unworthy, of deserving and undeserving, or productive and, and not productive, and I think that 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 needs space to be explored, because one is because some people can't work, but also because we should be able to actually uh, develop our skills, develop our learning and our knowledge in different ways. And when you have people who are dissatisfied with their current working conditions, and when you have uh, numerous people coming forward saying. I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to. I don't want to be 
um, in this environment anymore. Surely the question should be, what's the prob- what's wrong with the collective environment that we've created, not what's wrong with the individual? And a great example of this, I think, is um, is the current narratives used within within universities. At the moment, we have such drives around mental health at university. Valid issue needs exploring. But the emphasis is on saying we have uh, in, an increased rate of people uh, coming forward with mental health conditions, of being distressed in universities, of being uh, feeling out of isolation, of anxiety. And the response is not to say, is the way that the universities work causing this or perpetuating this? It's to say we should create uh, support groups that will fix you as an individual, that will help you um, address your own issues that are going on in terms of your health or your mental well-being. It never, it never focuses on the collective organisation that we've created um, uh, you know, and, and the consequences of that. So I think this demand or this desire not to work shouldn't be read as sale people are trying to be um, work shy or trying to uh, you know, fraudulently claim on social security for the rest of life, which we've seen as a response by right-wing conservative uh, thinkers when they've heard these these demands from activists. What it, what it's primarily saying is we should be um, we should be considering what is the basis of productivity. How do we assess what is productive? How do we assess what is important? Because it's not just about going to work and being. Uh, and conforming to the demands of the employer. It goes much beyond that. It's about actually being a valued and respected person in your community. It's about helping the, your community function. It's about giving ideas and thoughts which will inspire and stimulate other people. It will be people who are able to um, provide ideas and questions about what's wrong with the way that we co- uh, organize ourselves as a society. It's the people who are able to give hope to others that change will be positive. And that change is right, it will will come with uh, with activity and with activism and and campaigning. So there are different ways that I think uh, uh, that we should um, consider being valued and respected within society that goes beyond work. And a great example of this for anybody listening is think about all the people in your life who are important to you, who contribute to your development as a person, who you feel uh, proud of. Do all those people work? The answer will probably be no. So actually. How do we try to um, expand that idea and think about how throughout society there are people who want to work, who can work, who don't want to work, who can't work, and we should be creating an environment which celebrates all of us as individuals who are able to contribute towards creating a fairer and just and inclusive society. So far, Mira, we've talked a lot about the role of the private sector, and it's clear that there's been a restructuring of the economy over the last uh, 30 years or so in favour of private enterprise. But it's also clear that the state retains a very important role. So should the state use its gigantic economic power and ability to guarantee contracts to force companies to take up a social vocation towards people with impairment? Well, I... there is a case for uh, pushing forward with legislation to force uh, companies and employers to act. And I think that is um, is incredibly important in, in this process because, again, my uh, frustration with the education approach of saying uh, raise more awareness or get people to think more more positively about salespeople in the workplace is is very limiting and is, is almost nonsense. But the best approach, really, from my point of view, is you force people to move and then people start to think, why should I move? And then they think, actually, it's a good idea to move. So I think legislation is, is, is a way forward with this. But I would, I would, uh, in, yeah, I would, I would aspire to, uh, to try and get uh, the states, the member states across, across Europe, to, on the one hand, push forward legislation to protect sale people's access to and remaining in work, but at the same time, when you're coming up with the solutions as to how that will work uh, at the grassroots level, how that will work in communities, what needs to happen is, is is thinking about who is involved in coming up with the solutions, who is involved in coming up with uh, correctly identifying the problems. And to do that, it's not the professional uh, consultant 
who's done a course on disability or equality and diversity. And it's not the medical officer who's going to tell you that all the uh, solutions to your problem are linked to the, to the pathologization of disability. What we need to have is disabled activists uh, and campaigners represented within these different systems and processes that will be able to articulate the messages that I'm talking about or different ones in order to ensure that the, the, the correct approach is being taken, which places disability within a human rights context and uses that social model analysis in order to, uh, to move things forward. The problem and the, and the, and the, and the concern with that, because there is a problem, okay, of course everything, everything has a problem, is that when you, um, when you try to include disabled people, you have to um, bear in mind the, the consequences of, for disabled people of being incorporated within a system which is perpetuating exclusion and the marginalization of disabled people. So when you get access to these positions of authority and power to say things are wrong and things need to change, we need to be conscious that those people are allowing us to be in those positions because they want us to be co-opted into the system as it, as it currently stands and to perpetuate that. And this is why, and again, I've been criticized personally myself for, for my work in government and that's absolutely fine and valid uh, and others. But it's just being mindful that, again, if you're advising the employment sector, you're advising uh, the state, you need to be uh, critical in your response and your evaluation of what is currently taking place. You don't want to just provide ideas and tools which fits within the narrative of, in, in the wider sense, you know, creating the exclusion of disabled people in, in society, of uh, continuing with in-work poverty, of continuing with disabled people being overrepresented over in poverty and with no social mobility. But what we've seen, and this is, this is an important lesson, was what we've seen is many organizations of disabled people, organizations that are controlled and run by disabled people, who have been offered positions of power to advise the state or to provide support systems and contracts um, in order to, uh, on behalf of the state in order to improve disabled people's um, uh, access to employment have, in some, in some examples, have been slowly squeezed out or they've been co-opted so much that then the next time they com it comes around to assess their work and their conditions, they've been squeezed and pushed aside because they can't compete with the with the larger organizations, usually non-disabled organizations. So there is a concern for activists in that sense of be mindful of, of your access to the state and to the private sector in trying to influence and try to advise because you very easily could be hijacked or co-opted and, and then silenced. But, yeah, it's a, it's a, long, it's a long answer to, to, to your short question, but there is a, there's, there's a need for a legislation, but the, more importantly, I think, there is a need for disabled people to be in these positions of power who come from the background of social model analysis, who come from the background of a human rights approach to understand disability issues, who want to critique that neoliberal ableist lens, which is, which is currently being um, utilized across society. We need people in the, with those kind of thoughts and ideas to be in positions of power, not the tokenistic salesperson who has excelled to the board position because actually they got there by not challenging the system or by not uh, drawing upon the extensive marginalization that is happening across society. Given that we are rolling back positive discrimination in favor of ethnic minorities, should disabled people be given job opportunities because they have impairments? I don't think a quote system would help the, the, the topic that we're discussing because all you would get is either um, what happens at the moment in, those, in, in places which employ that, which is employers will just pay the fine or they'll find the loopholes to go around it. Or you will have salespeople taking those positions with the minimal amount of access and support needs or those that are being able to excel to those positions based on their education background, socioeconomic status. Because what, and then what happens, I go back to a point made before, is that these, these quotas may work in the short term or they, they, will, they will require quick responses to ensure that they can be filled. And then it sets a level of complacency within the state and within, legis within the uh, public and private sector, which is to say, well, look, we will measure success now based on these quotas. 
So it will never get to the root cause of the problem, which won't be addressed. Because, you know, an employer can have as many quotas as they want. They can fill the whole workforce with salespeople if they wanted to. But it's not going to challenge the problems of the education system, the problems with the assessment procedures, the problems with how salespeople are, uh, are, identi- uh, are, are scrutinized in terms of the uh, demand for access to the right level of support. So I don't see how a quota system will work other than be it being a short-term uh, you know, crisis-driven approach or it will just lead to um, shifting the focus away from the systemic problems that we've we've highlighted. I think, anyway, I got a great example. To give you an example, um, in some member states, people's access to services is localized. So it means that they can't leave their geographical location because their support system uh, or, the, or the allocation of that support system is locked to local government. So what happens then that you have quotas being put in place across the country, but it doesn't get to the root cause of the problem that a disabled person can't uh, have mobility to move to a different part of the country to fulfill their aspirations of work because the system doesn't allow for that. So the quotas may be filled up with people in the local area, or they may or they may not be filled up, but it doesn't then actually focus attention on the problems of the current support system in place. And again, that's a, that's a, you know, that, that can be uh, extracted to various different issues that we've talked about today, which is it doesn't get to the root cause of the problem. And when you have disabled people being uh, marginalised and not having access to empl- uh, to education system, uh, being scrutinised for their demand for support, how does uh, a quota system or how does a campaign to get to, uh, to get uh, employers to be proactive about employing sales people fix any of those problems. It doesn't. It just refocuses attention on something at the tip of the iceberg, rather than looking at the structural issues that need to be uh, need to be addressed. In that case, Miro, if you say that uh, you're against a quota system because it doesn't get to the root cause of the problem, what do you make of this practice of naming, faming and shaming companies with good and bad records on hiring uh, people with impairments? Is this a way of bringing more attention to the issues that we've been discussing during this podcast? No, not not really. What what it would do is, what I had done when when I looked at it, is that it has uh, raised awareness of perhaps the barriers that people face um, and the uh, ridiculous justifications that employers give as to why they shouldn't or they won't employ salespeople. But it's not going to create a momentum or uh, it's not going to increase um, the level of activism and social movements that want to create change in, the, in, in people's working conditions or gaining access to uh, employment. Can I just jump in there, though? Why do you say that? Because the British government, the UK government, published last uh, month in April the results of a survey that it conducted into employers with more than 250 people to try and highlight the issue of the gender pay gap. And what that has done is, as you've said uh, in your answer, draw attention to those employers who are not hiring women, who are not paying women uh, the same amount as, as they pay to men. Surely that allows people to point the finger at employers and say, well, look, you're not doing what you should. You, you're not being fair. That will create its own momentum, particularly with the importance, the growing importance of social media. And that, that kind of naming and shaming may well do what legislation and fines and all manner of things, quota systems, have not been able to do, which is to nudge companies in the right direction. So if, it, if the UK government is convinced that it can work on this issue of gender, uh, of the gender pay gap, why shouldn't it work to address these issues around uh, the employment of people with disabilities? Because, as I've said, what would happen is you would have uh, the focus of attention being placed on the employer without it being placed on the different aspects of a person's uh, trajectory through their life, which will also contribute towards their marginalisation. Well, can't that be a conversation that comes as a result of pointing the finger, so to speak, at the employer who's not doing the right thing? Well, I, I just think what it does is it, it allows, for example, the state to say, 
it is the responsibility of the employer to address the problem and not for us to think about our um, development and delivery and design of systems and structures um, which, which, which people go through in order to get to these positions of authority or positions of power. But what I would say, is, I, again, I don't have any problem with the naming and shaming, but if we think it's going to create um, the, the real action that is required to create um, proactive uh, solutions for sale people to be in employment, then I think it's just very naive. And the reason I say that is because you know I, I was deeply upset and frustrated, although you know many many people on the left uh, and sociologists and, and activists would will, will say that we you know the, these issues that are, are coming out now around uh, disparity between gender groups or between uh, communities has, has long been recognized for many years. But what you want to see, or what I hope would direct want to see, is all employers and employees saying this is disgusting and something needs to be done about it. We want to see workers standing next to other workers, standing next to other citizens, standing next to people who are who are marginalized in the community to say enough is enough and we need to take action to disrupt the ways that are, uh, of employers and of the state. But we don't see that. We just see this very slow uh, progression towards trying to force people to show their to show their books or to show how they um, their, their process for employing uh, people and what the, and what their justification is for doing that, and I think it just gives enough of a um, of a chance to push the uh, the light away from the issues that need to be highlighted in order to create the, the change that is required. So I, again, you know, again, I don't have a problem with it, but if we think it's going to be the the solution to the issue, or that we should rest upon it. I don't. I don't see how it's going to work. All right. Allow me to say that it's not about being. Uh, it's not about creating a solution necessarily, but it is about creating what people might call a teachable moment. So the United the United Kingdom government's action on publicising those companies which are doing good work around uh, gender discrimination. It's not just naming and shaming. It's also the faming part is very good could encourage good practice. We've seen in the United States with the arrest of two black men at a Starbucks um, eatery uh, that this has highlighted the discrimination that uh, some companies have towards uh, people of colour in the United States. And so as a result, Starbucks, because of the social media storm that was created, closed all of its branches for one afternoon and had diversity awareness training now okay we might we might scoff at that and say well it's just one afternoon but we're talking about incremental progress isn't there a case for saying that the teachable moments that could be created by having this practice of naming shaming and faming allied to the power of social media could advance your agenda and the kind of points that you've making that you've been making throughout this podcast much faster than this kind of wait until everything's perfect, try and get uh, all of these other conversations around a growth in activism and understanding of the social model. Aren't you expecting too much? Perhaps you just need to um, focus on the, 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 the small victories can be won that could be won through this particular practice. Well, it, you know, the Starbucks is, uh, uh, example is interesting. But what I think is, what I think is, is, is notable is that Starbucks responds to it. So the focus becomes Starbucks' response to what they did to do black, to black men. What it doesn't do, or why I don't think it has done satisfactorily, is raise the issue as to why this happened in the first place. Because Starbucks didn't create the culture where black people hanging around in an environment, waiting, incidentally waiting for their friend, but are then viewed to be uh, devious, uh, of, of a threatening nature. Now that, that wasn't created by Starbucks. That's going on for many years. You know, I'm reading. I'm reading Ellison at the moment, and he talks about this idea of, of, of you know being scrutinised for living in in in, in, a, in, a, in a majority white environment. So again, we shame or we frame or or, or we highlight uh, the employer, but it, then it becomes the employer's problem or the employer's solution to the issue, and there is not satisfactory um, emphasis on trying to say to all of us. Why are we allowing this to continue? 
in this environment because again you get because of the, because of this overwhelming desire for individual responsibility now in society you have people saying you take responsibility for doing that it's the staff in Starbucks that are the problem to give them all diversity training which I hope will be run by people who are who are who are, who are black but it probably may, maybe might might not but I don't know but what you what you have is a convenient lens then placed on the employer, placed on the staff, not on the culture within society, within that community that has created this emphasis of scrutinizing the behavior of black people. Yeah, and I, get I think that. it's the same it's the same for the group because again, you know, to get to to bring this into a disability example, you have the naming and shaming culture, you know, going on in, in in, uh, in in member states across Europe, and what is the response from the state? It's to bring out ideas of saying we should pay salespeople less than the minimum wage to incentivize them or the employer to work. All the ideas that come on the back of naming and shaming don't tackle the issue. So what was the point of naming and shaming? That's what I'm trying to get to. It's that if the solutions aren't there, or indeed the solutions are there, but the voices of the people who raise them uh, or, or promote them are so squashed or so sidelined that they don't get any opportunity to to um, to voice their ideas. Then the then the danger is you have the naming and shaming going on, and then the question is, well, what solutions are you going to have to it? So it's either to do what we've done before, which doesn't work, or it's to then have these reactionary ideas pro- proposed by neoliberal capitalist usually right-wing uh, rulers, because the majority of, of our global society now is, is run by the right, and this creates the uh, solutions which fits their ideas, which fits their purposes, and doesn't highlight the concerns being raised by activists um, from the communities that we've been talking about. Yeah, I hear that, and I think I, I understand the point that you make, but there is also a, a, another narrative, Miro, that could be uh, the idea that it's the throwing of the first small snowball that creates the avalanche, that creates change, so to speak. And so from there, not everything can lead to structural analysis of the barriers in society. Perhaps we need these incremental changes to push people as i say this the philosophy of the nudge then it's the nudge that creates uh, change not the big big giant leaps forward that come every generation but anyway let, let's move on um what what's been highlighted in the press and at the parliamentary assembly meeting is that once uh, people with impairments are in work they then have to face this issue of the disability pay gap so what can we do to deal with that Mira? So if you want to tackle the issue of the disability pay gap, we need to establish links between disabled activists and campaigners to the policy makers who are creating um, these, uh, these policies and drivers that are trying to tackle the disability pay gap. That would be my first comment. My second comment would be we need to think about how we assess the barriers that disabled people face and I want to move it away from the medical professional. I want to move it away from uh, corporations taking ownership, almost like the marketization of employment support. I want to see disabled people and their, and their organizations being the drivers for assessing the, the barriers in place and coming up with the solutions to them. And again, I think a great example of this is how Sale people talk about, uh, you know, extensive research, talk about how they don't have ownership of their, of their body because they feel like it's being owned by the professional or the assessor or the state you know, in terms of trying to access all these different environments and gain the right level of support. So they need, there is something in that that talks about how disabled people don't feel like they have ownership of who they are or that their identity is constantly being questioned by the state and by the corporations and by the assessors and I, I think we just need to shine a light on how expensive this approach current approach towards the provision of social security is and what I mean by that I don't mean in terms of providing to people with social security 
But what goes along with that? The extensive, uh, you know, privatized assessment procedures, the ineffective training programs, which disabled people are forced into when they're not in work, the idea of the sanction process, all these perpetuate the problem for those who are not in work and those who may perhaps want to work. And at the same time, if we want to ensure that sale people can and remain in employment, then we need to think about how the barriers that they experience are not direct cause of their body, but the way that the, that the collective organization of society has created that. So you don't blame the individual for struggling to get into work. You assess the public transport system. You assess how uh, much uh, personal assistance is provided to that individual. You assess the education system that they were trying to get access to, that, but they were, that they were prevented from doing so. All those issues is how we address the disability pay gap, not just focusing on the individual and using that line of try your hardest to succeed, because if you do, uh, then we'll use you as a role model. Throughout our conversation, Mira, we've been talking about the right to work, uh, what conditions need to be in place to encourage uh, the employment of more uh, people with with impairment, but it seems to me that the, the, the elephant in the room in this conversation is the importance of work as a bulwark against poverty. So we know that the unemployment levels and poverty levels for disabled people is staggeringly high in comparison. So is the universal basic income, which has just finished its trial in Finland, it's being trialled in seven countries, I understand, around the world, is this the answer to these two major issues it's not the complete answer and i think when you look at the history of the universal income uh, idea um what i think is quite interesting is uh, many people don't pick up on it is how it actually comes from the right originally so you have people like um oh, uh, milton friedman who talks about uh you know the idea of of the universal income because he and his colleagues wanted to undermine the welfare state. And when we think about the, the, the premise of universal income, it makes sense. If we think about our universal human rights declarations and our conventions, we talk about people having you know, the basic needs met, their minimal rights in terms of access to food and health and, and security and employment, and these are all basic rights. So on the one hand, you see that actually... Uh, that society should be guaranteeing those rights and therefore you can think about how a basic income would fit alongside that. So I think there is, there is some argument for, for, for advancing the, the, the implementation of a basic, um, of a universal basic right, but we need to be very mindful that it won't go far enough. Um, but actually, uh, you know, if we're looking again at the short term uh, and the crisis that is emerging at the moment around people's access um, to to, uh, to you know to to uh, um, I mean yeah uh, uh, if we're thinking about people's access to uh, basic rights being met and 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 uh, not being uh, starving in poverty and not being marginalised then this would go some way to tackle it but what I would be mindful of is a number of concerns that are emerging around universal basic income so on the one hand I think. We need to, and I suppose it ties into what we talked about before, which is in the current political and economic system, I don't think a, a universal basic income would tackle the issue of inequality. In fact, what it may do, and this may just be because I'm pessimistic, but it may, what it may do is it will allow uh, the private sector and the corporations to exploit the workers by not even considering the the impact of decisions that are taking place now on the future of the work. So, for example, the automation of, 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 of working industries and how will that will affect the demographics of the workforce. Those issues will be put off whilst we focus our attention on universal basic income. And the other point I would make as well in terms of disability is that I don't think what is being proposed in the moment is sufficient to address disabling barriers experienced by disabled people. So if we want to think about uh, rising inequality, then we need to radically change the way that we think about income and work and social cohesion, um, and universal basic income won't do that. But it would be a starting, pro it would be a starting point on the journey towards what, we what we've been talking about. So it would be welcomed in that extent. 
what I would say in terms of for the sale of people is that I'm quite interested in the work of Simon Duffy and uh, the people at the, at the Centre for Welfare Reform, which maybe some of you want to talk to for another podcast, on the idea of the basic income plus. Because what they're proposing, from my understanding, is having universal basic income, but then having additional layers to provide the additional support for the sale people to uh, access and be part of their community. So on the one hand, you have basic income, but then you also have the additional layer, for example, of meeting the, the additional costs of disability. You then have additional layers for the personalized support that people have and, or require. So the, the extra personal assistance to go about your life because society um, is, is organized in a way to disable uh, many people. So again, think about if you have universal basic income, what are you trying to do with it? Are you trying to implement it within the current system? Or are you using it as a gateway to radically overhaul our current political and economic structures? And I think that is where it will, it will either fail or succeed based on how we actually implement it in those two different um, pathways. You mentioned automation in your answer. What do you make of the view that the world of work, particularly in Western economies, is changing and that people with impairments could soon benefit from the increasing use of technology and blockchain advances that will allow them to be paid better for their skills? Well, there, there is no discounting how technology has been utilised in order to mobilise more action and more activity, provide salespeople with uh, gateways into uh, online communities uh, of having their voices heard in terms of activism, in terms of research. What I would be mindful of is um, is recognizing that technology is a blunt instrument. It is controlled by those at the, at the end of it and therefore it will uh, be used in different ways to suit different purposes. So on the one hand, um, I think it will be fascinating to think about how technology will will provide new and exciting ways uh, to uh, embrace assistive, assistive technology, uh, particularly for the sale of people, in order to go about the uh, go about their daily life. And we've seen that now in terms of uh, the technologies that we have, uh, in terms of computer-based uh, wheelchairs, um, you know, aids for people with various different impairments. But what I would be mindful of is trying to assess the impact that technology will have upon the, uh, the social model approach that we've been talking about in the rest of this conversation. Because if the social model of disability is, is there to question the way that we currently organize ourselves and to challenge us to think about how uh, this this environment that we've created is inaccessible for many people. Does technology actually provide uh, an excuse for the offline world to not actually do anything about the barriers that, that have been created or that are still there? So, for example, um, a very you know a very uh, limited example uh, on the, on the ground. If you have technology so that sale people can work from home. On the one hand, that's great, but then does it take the pressure off the employer and the state and society as a collective to do anything about the environments which prevented that person from gaining access in the first place? It's those kind of questions that we need to ask. And I also think it's about um, ownership of that technology as well. And I think that this is where we see a correlation between the discussion about disability and the discussion for the working class and the trade unions around the automa automation of of in, of in, um, of factory-based work, the question will be: Is who has ownership of this technology? Who has who is involved in the decision-making process as to who gets access to it, as to when it will be used, as to who benefits from it? Because if we take any examples from history, we know that the people who will utilize it in the long run will probably not be the ones who have ownership of it or have control over it. So it's about questioning where do salespeople. Um, gain access to those environments and those positions of power who will be able to say when the technology is used, how it is used, who it will be used for, and for what purpose in the long run. But, but, I, but I would say, but I, again, yeah, that's just a concern I have 
on the other side, I think that that, that we will see um, very exciting advancements in technology, and they will be used as a way to disrupt and resist the normality of society. Because what it will do is, technology will show us that we can demonstrate that uh, what you've been doing before is on that line of normality, on that line of conforming to what's expected from you. And for those who previously who were unable to do that, they've been pushed aside. But technology will blur that line of, of, of demonstrating that actually we can be part of this environment by doing things differently. And that doing things differently is acceptable and should be celebrated and should be promoted. But if our understanding of political and economic systems is, uh, is available to us, then we will know that there are, there are many caveats to the implementation of, of, uh, of, of these technologies. I, I, I think all the points that you make are, are, are very well founded. At the Parliamentary Assembly session in April, I interviewed the CEO of a company that's using blockchain technology to offer work to migrant refugees. And uh, this gentleman makes the point that the technology is advancing so fast that it's giving people who normally have no way of generating income, no means of supporting themselves and their families, the opportunity to do just that. So it's very, it doesn't take very long to imagine that if you were to apply this technology to, let's say, home-based people with impairment and give them the access to consoles, to computer screens, to voice, voice activated technology, etc, etc, and have a system, a, a verified system that allows them to be paid for their work. You create a new economy that can show the nonsense of of current practices. So my point to you to end this conversation is I understand also that history does tell us that those who control the technology or who have the ability to pay can 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 dictate the t can dictate the terms of payment and the conditions of labor but are you excited by the opportunities that may well be available to us within within a very short time that will explode the opportunities available to people with impairment i am intrigued but i am also concerned on that note, Miro Griffiths, thank you very much. Speak to you again. Cheers. Cheers.